that was powerful, wasn't it? Very powerful. Well, good morning to you. Good to, to be with you this morning. We are continuing our series today from Exodus entitled Junctions on the Journey. Um, last week, Mike Beaumont spoke to us from Exodus chapter 14, the account of the Israelites getting trapped between the Egyptians and the Red Sea. Uh, Mike spoke a brilliant message entitled Getting Stuck or Breaking Through. It's a message I'd strongly encourage you to listen to, and you can listen to it on our YouTube channel. Uh, so today we're picking things up in Exodus chapter 15 as we hit another interesting junction point for the Israelites on their faith journey with God. And the title of this morning's message is Encountering Bitter or Making Sweet. So let's read from Exodus 15, verses 22 to 27. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the deserts of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Marah. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? And then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood, and he threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. There the Lord issued a ruling and an instruction for them and put them to the test. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. And then they came to Elim, where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they camped there near the water. Well, we all have junctions on our journey, I want to suggest, where we find ourselves facing bitter waters. Situations, circumstances, and struggles that taste bitter and present as undrinkable. So the question is, what do we do? How do we face these situations of bitter waters? How do we find the drinkable waters of life that Jesus promised we could have all the time at such times when we're facing those bitter waters? Well, Moses and the Israelites faced exactly that situation in Exodus chapter 15. They crossed the Red Sea. They traveled three days in the harshest of deserts without any fresh water, uh, and just to remind you, this journey involves about two million people with their flocks and their herds, so a lack of drinkable water is a very, very significant issue. And when they do eventually come across water at Marah, those waters are so bitter to the point of being undrinkable. Marah in Hebrew means bitter, and in fact, the lakes in that area today are still known for their bitterness. When the thirsty Israelites come across these waters, their response is not dissimilar to when they got trapped up against the Red Sea. It's a negative response, not a faith response. Verse 24 says, they grumbled again at Moses for the fact they were in the desert, thirsty, with only bitter, undrinkable waters before them. They moaned, grumbled, and questioned, despite the fact that just previous to that, they'd experienced God miraculously, miraculously saving them from the Egyptians by parting the Red Sea. But again, in contrast to the Israelites, at this crucial junction on the journey, Moses made a different response, a faith response. It says he prayed to the Lord, and as a result of that faith response, which is what prayer is, God showed him a piece of wood, Moses took that piece of wood, threw it into those bitter waters, and it says, and the waters became fit to drink. I want to suggest to you this morning that we will all, at some point, come up against bitter waters at different points in our journey. But that God today, just like in Exodus 15, still provides wood. Wood that can be thrown by faith into those waters in a way that changes the undrinkable and bitter into something drinkable and sweet. So whatever bitter waters you're facing today, 
or may face tomorrow, let me this morning show you four pieces of wood you can throw into those waters. And so that you can remember this sermon, I have uh, got these visual aids here, which you can see, four pieces of wood. Um, I was very tempted um, to reinforce the impact of this sermon by throwing these pieces of wood into the congregation and deliberately hitting four different people firmly on the head. I thought that would help those four people in particular, and maybe the people just around them who the wood just missed, to really have this sermon indelibly burnt in their minds. But Linda persuaded me that wasn't a good idea, as it might damage our church's reputation, as well as four people's heads. So I abandoned what I thought was a very creative, impacting idea. For those watching online, that is a joke. I wasn't really intending to do that, just in case you thought I was. The first piece of wood you can throw into your bitter waters is the cross. There it is. Which is obviously apt because the cross that Jesus was crucified on for our sins was a wooden cross. So that's the first piece of wood, the cross. A few months ago, Linda and I were asked to see a couple in leadership. Uh, They were in leadership of a church in a very different part of the country, down south. And they'd been going through a very difficult time with their church. They had been unfairly and unjustly handled by some of the people in their church. Their good intentions had got interpreted wrongly and it had all somehow got out of hand. And when Linda and I saw this couple, they were very bruised and discouraged with the way they'd been unjustly and unkindly treated. And also, really, how they'd been wrongly accused and blamed for some things within the church. It was a powerful illustration of exactly what we're talking about this morning. A godly couple who set their hearts to serve God and serve his people, facing some very bitter waters. Unfortunately and sadly, these things can happen even in churches. Actually, this can happen to any one of us. We can be in this sort of acrimony with friends or even with family at times. As we sat and listened to this couple, the question was, how can we help them make these waters sweeter, somehow more drinkable? They're going back the following week into the same situation, a situation that isn't going to change quickly. What would can we give them that they can consistently throw into these waters what wood will bring some sense of hope and light to a situation that for them feels so black and hopeless? Uh, We actually, that morning being with them, gave them several pieces of wood, but the first piece of wood that came to hand that we passed to them was Romans 8, 17. Let's uh, read the passage, well, the verse together. It says this, now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. I said to them, you do understand that everything you're experiencing is exactly what Jesus experienced in his journey to the cross. We only have to read the Gospels and Scriptures like Isaiah 53 to understand Jesus experienced being despised, rejected, betrayed, misinterpreted and wrongly accused. And some of that was felt from friends, from people close to Jesus. Think of Peter, think of Judas. I went on to say to them, what you are experiencing is a taste of what Jesus experienced. In fact, what you are walking through in your suffering is not a random event orchestrated by unkind people. You're walking through a profound spiritual experience. You're walking through a tangible experience of Romans 8, 17, we said to them. You're you're sharing in the sufferings of Christ. You're experiencing to a new depth what he went through for you to save you. The sacrificial price he paid to forgive you and bring you into relationship with God as your father. I said to them, I know this is horrible, but be encouraged. There's something deep, 
profound and intimate going on in terms of your fellowship with Christ at this time. You are with him in his sufferings and he is with you in your sufferings, probably to a depth you've never experienced before. And of course, there's a great hope associated with Romans 8, 17. The hope is, if we share in the sufferings of Christ, we will also share in his glory. The Bible tells us the sufferings of the the cross that Jesus went through were not an end in themselves. They were to purpose. They were to glorious purpose. What came forth through Christ's suffering and death was glorious resurrection, glorious salvation for you and for me and for millions upon millions of people across this world. What came forth from Christ going to the lowest place in his suffering was God ultimately raised him to the highest place and gave him the name above all other names, Philippians 2, Philippians 2 tells us. I said to this couple, you need to continually, daily, throw this piece of wood that is the cross into your bitter waters, reminding yourselves each and every day that you are sharing in the sufferings of Christ, but declare alongside that that sharing in Christ's sufferings also comes with a promise. I said, what you're going through is horrible, but know this. God will ultimately, through it, work something great and glorious within you and through you. Jesus is both your example of how to walk in it and the cross and the resurrection, your visual aid, your confidence that there isn't anything too black and horrible for God to not bring something good and glorious out of it. If God brought forth glorious life out of the darkness, suffering and death that Jesus experienced at the cross, then there is no situation that exists that God can't do that through. I also added to them, and by the way, as we talked to them, by the way, I said, Linda and I know this is true because we walked through exactly the same difficulties at Tees Valley Community Church between 2005 and 7. And our testimony through that season would be that it was the most horrible of times, but ultimately ended up being one of the most glorious times because of how our fellowship with Christ deepened during that time and because of what God ultimately adjusted in us, taught us, grew in us, and did through us, even in this church. When Jesus was on the earth, and especially when he went to the cross, there's no suffering he did not experience. He suffered mentally, emotionally, relationally, and spiritually. Hebrews 2 and Hebrews 4 make it clear that Jesus shared in our humanity and suffered and was tempted in the same way we are, yet was without sin, maintaining his hope and trust in God. I don't know what bitter waters you are facing, what struggles, temptations and challenges and suffering you're facing. But whatever they are, I want to encourage you to see them through the lens of the cross, through the lens of Romans 8, 17. Throw your piece of wood that is the cross into those bitter waters with a reminder to yourself, to your circumstances and to the enemy that your fellowship is with Christ in what you're going through and that there's an incredible promise that accompanies you in it all, a promise of ultimately sharing in his glorious life. The couple we spent time with left us still facing the same scenario, but somehow being reminded of the piece of wood that they had to hand lifted their heads, hearts and spirits and somehow made those waters somewhat sweeter and more drinkable to face. I trust this morning that as you take up the truth of the cross and Romans 8, 17 and you take those that verse and the cross to heart, that whatever bit of waters you're facing, they may somehow become more drinkable. As you appreciate, God is with you as you face those waters and is well able to work something good and glorious through it all. The second piece of wood that God has given us is thankfulness. There was no, there you go over there, just in case you've not seen that, And there, there was no sense 
when the Israelites hit those bitter waters at Marah, of them remembering what God had done for them in bringing them out of Egypt or in parting the Red Sea. They were simply fixated on what they didn't have and moaned and grumbled on the basis of what wasn't. There's an enduring theme that runs right the way through Scripture. It's the constant exhortation to remember. To remember what God has done for us and what God has given us and to express gratitude and thanks to him for that. Thanksgiving and gratitude to anyone that's given anything to us is right and proper. And that's why we teach our children, isn't it, to say thank you when they receive something. Thanksgiving and gratitude to God for what he has given and done is therefore right because it is what God deserves and anything less is wrong and inappropriate. However, there's another reason thanksgiving is important. And that reason is because of how it affects our hearts and the drinkability of our waters. You can always tell what's troubling me the most at any given time, what situation I'm finding most difficult to face. You just have to, would have to listen to me praying at the beginning of the day because it's likely to be one of the first things I pray about. At the moment, there are three or four, four things I'm, where I'm facing my own bitter waters, situations I am in, within which I'm facing things I don't really want to face. One situation in particular that's very close to me is a scenario where I could get overwhelmingly discouraged and fearful. The only way I can handle it is to keep throwing the wood of thanksgiving into it. I keep reminding myself and thanking God for the good things that already exist within the situation, things that he has already given and done. I keep reminding myself and thanking God for supernatural breakthroughs and answers to prayer I've previously seen in the lives involved in this particular difficulty. And I keep thanking God for his promises over the situation. That thanksgiving helps me to be filled with faith rather than fear. It helps me to stay soft-hearted as opposed to getting cynical and judgmental. And it keeps me patiently and positively persevering in the situation rather than getting negative and moaning. One of the most important and effective pieces of wood to throw into bitter waters is the wood of thanksgiving. It's a way of celebrating and honouring God for what is rather than succumbing to moaning about what isn't. I don't know how you've personally handled the pandemic. I would describe the restrictions and things we have lost over the period of time as waters that have been somewhat bitter. I've not enjoyed many, many aspects of this pandemic. Um, Thanksgiving to God has been a very important piece of wood for me to throw into my waters over the last 18 months. Thanksgiving to God for what we did have. Thanking him for our health, for our home, food on the table, a job and regular income that we didn't lose. Thanksgiving to God for what we could do. The ability to walk outside. I rejoice many times that we live near the coast as I was able to walk on the beautiful beach between uh, Mask and Salt Burn. I was continually thanking God that we were able to connect with family, friends and church online. The opportunity to connect outside with grandkids was also something I thanked God for, even if it was, if, even if it was mostly in temperatures that didn't rise above five degrees centigrade and thanksgiving for God to God for the good things that he was clearly doing and working even in the midst of restrictions in me personally in our family and in the church and I'll talk about that a little bit more in my next point celebrating and thanking God for what we have had has been for me an absolutely essential piece of wood in ensuring my bitter waters have remained drinkable during this pandemic without it Without doing that, I would have been vulnerable to getting negative, being full of woe, and probably moaning about a number of government decisions. But I haven't gone there. I haven't done that. Because God has graciously given me this amazing piece of wood called thanksgiving to throw into my bitter waters. My encouragement to you this morning, whatever bitter waters you're facing, celebrate and thank God for what you do have, rather than becoming fixated on what you don't have. 
throw your wood of thanksgiving into your waters and see how much more drinkable those, those waters become. You know what? I really do need to throw these bits of wood into the... Uh, it's sort of been begging it all the time, hasn't it, really? There's, there's two of them. Waters are a little bit uh, better down here already. The third piece of wood is God's word. Let's get that. The word of God is the third piece of wood. I love that illustration that Mike Beaumont gave last week in the context of hearing God's word and holding on to it. He told the story of when he was asked by the church in Oxford to look for a large new premises. He recounted how they'd had a time of praying together and how God had spoke to them specifically. They received some prophetic words that said it would be next to the River Thames, which wasn't what they wanted to hear because that's where the most expensive property was. Then some words about it being next to an iron bridge, which was restrictive because all the bridges in Oxford are stone other than one bridge. And finally, they received a word from God about how when they found the right place, it would have a big yellow JCB in the grounds. There were very few possibilities at the time in Oxford for them when it came to looking for a building. But when a possibility eventually opened up, it was next to the Thames, by the only iron bridge, and then the first time of visiting had a large JCB, yellow JCB in the grounds. I don't actually know if there's any other colour than yellow to JCB, but that's another story. But what was interesting was the bit of waters that they then faced in acquiring the building and getting the relevant planning permission. They experienced significant opposition, starting with the senior planning officer who said, over my dead body will this building get permission to be a church. And not only did they meet resistance from the planning department, they also met it from the local council. The councillor for their area introduced himself as a humanist dedicated to seeing religion totally eradicated from Britain. Together they put so many restrictions on the use of the building, it almost made it impossible for them to use it as they wanted to when it came to them being a church. What were they facing as a church? They were facing bitter waters, the bitter waters of opposition but they had a piece of wood to throw into those bitter waters. What was the piece of wood? It was the fact that God had spoken. He had specifically led them to that building, and they knew with absolute certainty God had promised it to them. The building by the Thames, by the Iron Bridge, with the yellow JCB in the grounds. So by faith and through prayer, they continually threw their piece of wood into those bitter waters of opposition. And by the end of that process, those waters had become sweet and drinkable. An appeal process overturned all the council and planning department's opposition and restrictions and enabled them to use it as they do today as a tremendous resource base for the church and for the extension of God's kingdom. Listen, we are a people who have God's word, God's scriptural word, God's prophetic word. When God speaks, we need to throw what God has said into our bitter waters because God's word has the power to change the nature of those waters. As a church, we had a significant amount of growth and momentum in the second half of 2019 and early 2020 in terms of new people joining us and people getting saved. In the nine months prior to the pandemic, we saw not far short of 100 new people joining us regularly on Sunday mornings. And in the three months prior to the pandemic, 30 people made salvation commitments. Then we hit the pandemic with all its restrictions in terms of meeting together and engaging with people. Virtually everything had to move online. For me, as the senior leader of the church, the experience of hitting those limitations and seemingly slamming the brakes on that momentum and all the good things that were happening was like coming across bitter waters. We did our best in it all, and I'm very grateful to all those involved in working and adjusting to get us online and move us forward in very challenging circumstances. But the mainstay of my approach to the bitter disappointment of being so restricted has been to throw my pieces of wood into those bitter waters, to take those things I know God has said and promised and by faith declare them over our journey as a church through this pandemic. God's word and promise to us about doubling our depth, a reference to people going deeper in their relationship with Jesus, and doubling our breadth, doubling the number of people that would be part of this church family. God's word and promise given many years ago about upgrading our land, a reference to a season when growth and breakthrough in all sorts of areas of church life would be considerably easier. 
God's word to us, which I preached to you in April, about the meanwhile of God, that whatever we are seeing and experiencing, there was a hidden space, a meanwhile, within which God always works. And I have to say, you know, I've thrown those pieces of wood so regularly into the waters for this church over the last 18 months. And I have to say, I've been thrilled with what we've seen God do as momentum again picks up. Over the last year, we've continued to see salvations and to baptize people. In the last four weeks alone, we've seen eight people give their lives to Christ. Many of you have watched in our Sunday services and through what we've put online during the pandemic, some of the incredible stories of transformation of, by Jesus in the lives of those we've baptized. And guess what? There's more baptisms to come. 20 to 30% of people in our in-person services over the last few weeks are people who are new to our church. During the pandemic, people have continued to be added to our community groups. We've continued to receive people into family membership of the church. In fact, in our Sunday service in a few weeks' time, we're receiving 18 new people who want to commit to being part of this great TVC church family. All in a pandemic. All in the midst of restrictions. And by the grace of God, during a time of economic hardship and job losses, our regular giving has not only not dropped, which would be a miracle in itself, do you know it's actually gone up? So a big, big thank you to all of you who've faithfully given, tithed and invested financially into God's work. What is happening through this church couldn't happen without your financial faithfulness. And so in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of considerable restrictions and us facing some very bitter waters as a church, God has been true to his word and promises. He's given us story after story, testimony after testimony of his faithfulness to keep working in the meanwhile. His faithfulness to continue upgrading our land. His faithfulness to continue to bring about double depth and breadth in us as a people and as a church. God has been faithful where we've been faithful to keep believing him and faithfully kept throwing the wood he's given us, his word and his promises into our bitter waters. I want to encourage you as Mike encouraged us last week. Mike encouraged us to hear and to hold what God has said. Hold on to what God has said. I'm encouraging us to hear and throw into our bitter waters what God has said. Essentially, Mike and I are saying the same thing. God's word is powerful. It has the ability to change lives and circumstances. Read it, listen to it, live it, do it, and throw it into your bitter waters and see what God does. And then finally, briefly, the fourth piece of wood, prayer. You know, Linda and I put everything and everyone we're praying for on a list, our prayer list. When God has answered that prayer, we move them off the prayer list and it becomes part of the answered prayer list. It is amazing when you do that. I tell you, it is amazing how many situations move from the praying for list to the answered list. And are there some prayers or situations that are on, there, on our list for a long time? Yes, there are. Are there some prayers that seem to be unanswered? Yes, there are. However, what is absolutely clear is that the vast, vast majority of things that we pray into move from the praying for list to the answered list. Prayer is an incredible... I didn't get it, did I? I didn't put it up there. That guy worked on these for ages. Cut a tree down and carved it all myself. I used the whole of last week to do that. That's the word of God. That's the wrong one, but we've done that one as well. <laughs> This is it. This is it. Prayer. That's for the one we're on. Throwing our prayer. I want to say to you that prayer is an incredible piece of wood we can throw into absolutely any bitter waters we or others end up facing. I don't know about you, but I really appreciated hearing what Vicky shared with us this morning. Clearly, she's had to face some very bitter waters. What was really powerful about what Vicky shared is that she's throwing all four pieces of wood into her waters. So some amazing answers to the piece of wood called prayer. A stomach ulcer she was immediately relieved of, an ovarian cyst that disappeared, and a brain tumour she came completely free from. And in the midst of ongoing challenges with autoimmune diseases, she's throwing a piece of wood called God's Word into her waters. 
as she quotes from Psalm 23. Don't know if you noticed that. Declaring God is with her, even in the valley of the shadow of death, comforting her with his rod and his staff. And she also quotes Jesus' promise to always be with her. And she's throwing the piece of wood that is thankfulness into her waters as she thanks God for answering her previous prayers and as she thanks God for his ongoing faithfulness and as she gives thanks to God for continually being with her in all that she walks through. And she's also throwing the piece of wood that is the cross into her waters as she declares in the midst of ongoing suffering that God still has purpose for her in the midst of it. And that he will ultimately work everything together for her good and for his glory. So a big thank you to Vicky for sharing with us. And for giving us a great example of someone who's faithfully throwing her four pieces of wood into the bitter waters she has had to face. And can I encourage you to maybe pray for Vicky in an ongoing way as well. So in conclusion. uh, Let's get my pieces of wood back. So in conclusion, we all at times, like the Israelites in their journey, face bitter waters. Waters that seem difficult and undrinkable. But God has made a grace provision for us in those times. He's given us four remarkable pieces of wood to throw by faith into those bitter waters. The wood of the cross, the wood of thankfulness the wood of his word, and the wood of prayer. I pray that as you move forward in your faith journey with God, that you will increasingly grow in your confidence and ability to use these pieces of wood, and that through doing so, you will increasingly have testimonies of God's remarkable grace in making your bitter waters sweet. God bless.